Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Good morning, everyone. Um, before we start, is there anyone that is here for the first time or after a long absence? Oh, welcome. What's your name? Uh, I'm Ian. Ian, welcome, Ian. Um, what about in Zoom? Do you have first time comers? Um, yes, my name is Jeb. This is my first time with uh, this group. Thanks. Great. I'm welcome. from Colorado. I'm calling in from Colorado. That's great. Yeah, we're, we're happy to have people from all over. Um, welcome, Jeb. Um, so it's our tradition to go around the room and say our names. Uh, so my name is Juan. Ian. I'm Brad. Hey, Richard. George. Jack. I'm Mike. <clears throat> my name is Cass. I'm Phil. Grisha. Jeff. My name is Stephanie. I'm Greg. My name is Henry. Good morning, everyone. Um, we have a bunch of uh, folks in on Zoom as well. Um, so I'll introduce our speaker today. Um, Kevin Griffin is a Buddhist teacher, a leader in the mindful recovery movement, and an author known for his innovative work connecting Dharma and recovery, especially through his 2004 book, One Breath at a Time, Buddhism and the Twelve Steps. He has been, he has been a Buddhist practitioner for over 35 years and a teacher in Spirit Rock Meditation Center for more than two decades. He reaches a broad range of audiences in Dharma centers, wellness centers, and secular mindfulness settings. His most recent book, just published in October of 2022, is Living Kindness, Meta Practice for the Whole of Our Lives. To learn more and to see his teaching schedule, go to www.kevingriffin.net. Um, welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Everybody, hello, folks, near and far. I'm sorry I didn't get to come uh, into the city today. I live in Berkeley, and uh, it wasn't actually the weather that kept me out, although that might have been a good excuse. But uh, I just I told Jeff a lot of people around me have been getting sick lately, and I'm, I have managed to avoid that, and so I'm uh, trying to avoid it. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult, um, when, when, uh, so much of our mental health and spiritual health is dependent upon community and connection to be isolated. And I was saying to my wife the other day that this reminds me of the early days of the pandemic because, uh, in California, at least many of us have been very isolated these days with the weather and, you know, I'm used to getting outside a lot and, uh, as is she. And so, um, I'm hanging on. <laughs> it's going to, it's going to stop raining in a couple of days, but I, I promise they promise. Um, I, you know, I, I was, I'm going to talk a bit about this book that Juan mentioned, uh, living kindness and, I suspect I may have already given a talk about this to, to the, Gay Buddhist Fellowship, um, because, uh, an earlier version of it was published in 2018. So that's five years ago. And then, uh, a couple of years ago, Shambhala, the publisher, originally I published it just straight through uh, Amazon. And, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Shambhala, uh, took it on as a project. And so it's getting a lot more distribution and, and they helped me to, to tighten it up a bit, clean up some things in it. So, so it's nice to get, uh, have it, have a second life. Um, so it's, uh, the book is called living kindness and it, it's, um, 
you know, anyone familiar with Buddhist teachings, uh, will recognize that that's a play on words, uh, that uh, a play on the Buddhist teaching called loving kindness. And, um, it's a, it's a, an attempt, I guess, a kind of, can I say reappraisal of how we approach this practice and these teachings? And, and it's something comes out of, you know, really decades of, of reflection on my part that, that, um, you know, eventually came out as a, as a teaching in a, in a book. And it, it's, there's a couple of kind of core intentions, uh, behind this, this idea of living kindness and behind what I, what I wanted to talk about. Uh, the one is the, this idea of what, what we call loving kindness and kind of how it's been presented. And, and I think maybe it's not even the presentation, but maybe the way it's received or, or, or perceived. Um, and my first real questioning around this came up when I was teaching some college students to do the loving kindness meditation. And I found that they avoided the difficult parts <laughs> They just focused on the the feel good parts, and they and they didn't work with the the pra- part that's about the neutral people, and they didn't work especially with the part around difficult people or what's called the enemy in the in some of the texts, and they also didn't do the practice of kind of radiating. You know, the the practice of loving kindness is not. Uh, meant to be something to just make you feel good. That's a, that's a byproduct, a hope, hopefully a byproduct. Uh, it often can make us feel good. Um, but it's, it's really meant to train us to be more universally loving more and to discover what unconditional love is and, and then to develop insight as well into our interconnection with all beings. And this is a fundamental Buddhist principle, right? I know you're, I presume you're all familiar with at least all the people here who are, have been around the Buddhist world for a while, which I think most of you have. And so uh, it's interesting to maybe, uh, think of it as a, I don't know if this is like reverse engineering or backward, but to think of it, the practice as being founded in this insight into interconnection and interdependence and the fact that we are not separate, you know, and that it's a natural expression then of realizing, oh, you know, my, my little being, my, you know, my consciousness, my, my body, my sense of being this separate person is really an illusion. You know, nothing about my life happens apart from the world. You know, my very life is dependent on two other people coming together and creating another life. And then everything, of course, as infants and children were totally dependent. But even as full as adults, you know, if I look around my home, I, I, I didn't build this house. <laughs> I didn't build this chair. I, didn't, I wouldn't know what how, how to... The first thing about building a computer or creating a program like Zoom, I'm totally dependent on, on the world and, 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 you know, the, the, this rain that we've been getting is such a great example of this. You know, here we've been living in California. Those of you who are in California and it's true in many 
areas under these drought conditions for years and these terrible fires, you know, and, and to, to think that somehow, oh, you know, that's, I'm separate from that. I'm, you know, I don't have to deal with that is, is of course absurd. You know, uh, I have to breathe, you know, I have to breathe it, which means that I am in every moment, my dependence and interconnection with the world is keeping me alive. I, uh, it's, it's right there. So to go back then to maybe the, the other end of this, the, uh, the very personal end of loving kindness, which is where the meditation uh, typically begins. It's, uh, uh, we're often guided to start by practicing loving kindness toward ourselves. And it's interesting that as, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I th- think in general terms, you know, most of us are uh, self-centered and, and, you know, and not in necessarily don't even have to think of it in negative terms. But, you know, we we have to take care of ourselves first. That how much we can fall into self-hatred. <laughs> and or just self judgment self criticism i uh <laughs> sometimes other people criticize us too i i got an email this morning from someone complaining about something i they heard me they listened to a talk i gave to, in twenty ten <laughs> it's the trouble with the internet everything's out there forever right and and they didn't like something I said. And so, you know, so this morning I've been kind of walking around with this little like, oh, like I'm a bad person. I'm a bad teacher. I'm a, you know. <laughs> and, and and how how we fall into this way, of the self view of negativity. And I talk about this in the book, Living Kindness. I'll, I'll actually read the, this little portion because I, 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 I I think this captures it, you know, in a way. This is a, it's actually chapter one after the introduction. It's, and it's called May I Be Happy Living, Loving Yourself. I don't like myself any more than other people like themselves. <laughs> I don't know. I find, I find this amusing. Anyway, there's nobody in the world who knows better all my failings, my impatience and irritability, my prejudices and delusions, my moodiness and self-centeredness. And don't even get me started on my past. (laughs) Suffice it to say, I lived the life of a self-indulgent musician for almost 20 years. Not a lot to be proud of there. Not a lot to like about myself. So the challenge of practicing loving or indeed living kindness starts with the very first step in the process, sending love to yourself. Many people find this to be an intimidating order. But I think that this difficulty results from another misunderstanding of metta. So metta is the term for loving kindness in Buddhism. You don't earn metta by being extra good or nice. You don't get metta points for being generous or selfless. Metta isn't really a part of that karmic economy. It's more of a birthright. And and it, the simplest way, I think, to think about that in terms of ourselves is to think about other people and think, would I judge other people the way I judge myself? Or would I treat other people the way I treat myself? Um, and, you know, it's not to say that we are always nice to other people, but when we see someone suffering, you know, if we have any kind of, you know, spiritual or emotional maturity, I would say. There's just this natural response, right? I mean, I don't have to think, oh, does this person deserve, uh, you know, my compassion? You know, they're sick or they're, you know, they've had a, a loss or, you know, they, our friend 
you know, gets fired from a job or, you know, you, you don't sort of think, well, I don't know if you really deserve compassion, you know, uh, and yet for ourselves, and, and again, I can't speak for everyone, and I know this isn't true of everyone, but it's a common reaction that that we're kind of like, oh, I don't know, you know, what did I do wrong? You know, uh, you get sick and you're like, what What did I do wrong? It's like, you're sick, you know. Why, why is the first thing you go to a, ju- a judgment, you know? So... You know, so, so what we're faced with, you know, in this practice is, is to see our own internal habits, mental habits. And this is the starting point. And, you know, this is one of the connections I think that's important to make about something like a loving kindness meditation is that it doesn't sit separate from other Buddhist practices. It depends upon mindfulness. Because if my goal is to be loving and to practice loving kindness, the first thing I need to do is see if I'm doing that. And if I'm not doing that, uh, have some way of responding to that. How, how do I, how can I respond to that? You know, so, so this morning was very interesting for me because I'm like, oh, can I give a Dharma talk on loving kindness? Okay. <laughs> And, you know, and I've got this negativity in my mind and, and feeling it emotionally. And, um, and so, so, you know, it was, was my practice this morning was like, okay, just notice that, you know, and then what I do is I try to apply, you know, this broader awareness, like, okay, that's one person. That's a talk you gave 12 and a half years ago <laughs> and they didn't like it. And, and notice the language they're using in their email. It sounds like they've been watching a lot of Fox news or something, <laughs> you know, and just kind of like, okay, keep a bigger perspective. Like, and you know what? Like there are times when I say things that aren't helpful. And there are, th- and there are people who aren't going to like me. And that's the risk. You know, you put yourself out. If you want to put yourself out and do something in the world, you have to risk being criticized. Okay. Can you live with that? Can you, can you be okay with that? Yeah, I can be okay with that. And then uh, one of my other big, you know, go, go to's is impermanence. It's like, you know, in a few days, I'll have completely forgotten about this. This is going to be, this isn't important. This isn't important in my life. But, but again, it's so easy for us. And this is why my mindfulness is so important to, you know, some one thing, right? I think this is very common. One thing gets our attention, tends to be a negative thing. And then we just look at it and look at it and grows and grows and grows and it takes us over. As opposed to, oh, that's unpleasant. It's like I stubbed my toe. That hurts for a moment, but that's okay. You know, not, oh my God, I'm such an idiot because of the, I walked and I stubbed my toe. What is wrong with me? I just, you know, I'm not, I'm just such a failure in life. And it reminds me of all the times I've stubbed my toe. And what about the times when I, when I cut myself, when I was chopping onions and, you know, (laughs) it's like we turn these, uh, these small things into a story, right? Uh, th- this is why uh, awareness is so important, you know. And, and and then there's the holding of the feeling. So the, uh, the uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about the the feeling of loving kindness. You know? uh, the feeling of loving kindness is one of the most beautiful feelings we can have. The feeling of love. We don't even have to call it loving kindness, you know, the feeling of love. So rich and, uh, you know, brightening it. It gives us this view in this of the world and a, and a sense of wholeness and completeness. And, and so it, it, you know, if you experience that, 
And I hope you have experienced that. In the times when I've had that experience, the, the strongest has been on uh, meditation retreats. And, um, you know, your mind gets pretty quiet and you're really in a peaceful place. And then you start focusing on loving kindness and cultivating that quality. And there are times when it can just sort of uh, take you over and you're immersed in this beautiful feeling. And it can seem that that that's what loving kindness is. It's that feeling. Oh, now I know what uh, now I know what loving kindness is. Now I've experienced it. Great. Now what I need to do is feel this, practice this all the time, and uh, and just feel this love all the time. Well, you've now fallen into a trap. Because there's no feeling that you can have all the time, right? Feelings are impermanent. And when we get the idea that, oh, this is loving kindness. And then when it goes away, I'm not, I don't have any loving kindness. Then once again, we're in this conflict. We're in this conflict with ourselves or what we, how we think we should be. I should feel this. Yeah. That's, you know, the first time that I smoked marijuana when I was listening to Jimi Hendrix, I thought, I want to feel like this all the time. <laughs> and I stayed high for a long time after that. <laughs> but it didn't work. You know, I didn't I I couldn't sustain that feeling. Eventually you get tired, even of Jimi Hendrix, which is saying a lot. But. It was just that that delusion that somehow I'm going to capture something and hold on to it. You know, when you fall in love with an with someone else, with another person, and you want to hold on to that, where does that lead? You know, that you can't do it. You can't hold on to that feeling. And so the the feeling of loving kindness and the feeling of love, these are beautiful things, and they're things to be enjoyed and things to be inspired by and guided by certainly that experience on a retreat of feeling love universal loving kindness is something that as i talked about can give me insight and make me realize i'm not separate from the world and and i may not be able to take that feeling with me but i can take that idea with me and i can awaken that idea each day intentionally to remind myself i am not separate i am part of and connected with this world i'm connected with every being and everything in this world ah you know that's a freeing insight and a supportive insight one that one that helps me to not fall into negativity to to isolation to to judgment it helps it helps me to awaken caring and compassion and even to awaken the feeling of love just the thought of it can can bring up that feeling so so uh, we can see then that loving kindness it depends upon mindfulness it also is an insight practice so again uh, you know part of the premise of this idea uh, that i'm trying to get at in this book is that Loving kindness isn't something that's separate from the rest of Buddhism or that's separate from the rest of Buddhist meditation. It's interconnected with it. It depends upon mindfulness. It supports insight. So when we start to see this, that we don't have to feel all gushy and lovey all the time to be uh, a person inspired by loving kindness, uh, then this idea, this term living kindness starts to, starts to resonate. I think it starts to make sense because you see, Oh, no matter how I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, I can still be living kindness. So interesting. One of the influences on, on my work is a, 
a great scholar monk, uh, Venerable Analio. And in one of his books, he talks about following the precepts to not kill, not to steal, not harm sexually, not harm verbally, not lie, not use intoxicants to the point of heedlessness. But these simple guidelines for living that the Buddha put out. And, and again, these are seen as kind of one part of the path, right? Oftentimes, or kind of presented as, oh, you should do this. But maybe not shown as being interconnected with the rest of the path. But in fact, Analio points out that when we live by these principles, which are principles of non-harming, we are acting out of compassion, that it is a compassionate act to not kill, steal, or harm people in any way. You know, and and I, I try to follow the precepts. I'm not perfect in that regard, but but I do try to follow them. And I, and I would typically, without this idea from Analio, I would typically think, oh, that's like, I don't get any particular benefit from that. I mean, yes, I, I get some worldly benefit or whatever, maybe karmic benefit, but it's not really helping anybody that I'm doing this. But then you realize, oh, yeah, there's a lot of people like it's not so much that I'm not doing this. It's recognizing that when you do these things, when you kill and steal and harm se- people sexually and lie, that you do tremendous damage to the world. And and in fact, the suffering of the world is largely based on people doing these things and breaking these precepts. So that, you know, when I, when I was first introduced to the precepts, I thought of them as kind of the kindergarten version of Buddhism. Like the real Buddhism is meditating for hours and hours and, you know, getting enlightened. Oh, those precepts. Oh, that's just for kids. Well, no, they're the things that will change the world. And so it's an act of compassion. If you are living by the precepts, you are living kindness. You are practicing loving kindness and compassion in your daily life, just as a kind of baseline. And I, that makes me feel good. You know, I, f- I feel good about that. And, and it makes me really appreciate that aspect, the what's called sila, aspect of Buddhism, the ethics and morality. And, you know, I, I, in my, my later years now, in my, in my, uh, later years of being a Buddhist and being a human, because I, uh, you know, my, uh, my bio there is a little older. I've, I've been practicing for over 40 years now. Um, the people that really inspire me are the monks and nuns. And they're the ones when I listen to a, Dharma talk, you know, uh, when I read, uh, that's, those are the people that I study. And it's interesting. And, and these are the ones who you think, well, they're the ones who are really enlightened and really advanced. And they're probably going to teach about emptiness and uh, enlightenment. A lot of what I hear from them is about the precepts and about sila and living out of kindness not hating, non-hatred, non-judgment. So I, I I take that as being a a good a good set of guidelines to to live out of kindness. Now there's this term that shows up in the Buddhist suttas and and, and I will say that the uh, besides my uh wish to sort of expand people's understanding of loving kindness. The other goal in this book was to bring out some of the richness of the Buddhist suttas, these early teachings. And so when the Buddha talks about loving kindness in those suttas, he often, instead of saying loving kindness or metta, he often says non-ill will or non-hatred as a kind of, as a substitute for loving kindness. And I find that, you know, I I admit that for many years I read those suttas and I just kind of, my eye just kind of ran over those words. And I was just like, okay, he's just talking about loving kindness. 
But there are a couple of things that are worth uh, looking more carefully at in his use of that term, non-ill will. And, and the first is to just compare it to uh, the word love. If someone says to you, you should love everyone, that has a certain idea and, you know, and it's a challenge and it's a beautiful challenge. It's very inspiring, but it's also sort of, in some ways it can feel unreachable, or at least certainly at some moments it can seem unreachable. But the idea of non-ill will is don't hate anyone. And that, for me, in a way, kind of narrows it down. Now you're not thinking about everybody. You're just thinking about the people that you are inclined to feel negatively about. And, and you're not being asked to embrace them necessarily, but rather see if you can just let go of the negativity. And maybe uh, in the, in some of the commentarial teachings, it suggests try, just try to turn them into a, a neutral person or to have neutral feelings about them. It's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not loving you, but I'm not going to hate you. So I like that again, just as a, it's like a subtle shift in thinking and perspective. Oh, all right. Just, and, and it's kind of like, Instead of this idea of loving everybody where it's sort of like this thing has to flow out of me. <laughs> Instead, it's like, oh, I, it's more like having a boundary. Like, okay, I'm just going to restrain and refrain from l- letting that negativity go out, go out of me. And I'm just going to stay within myself. A little different in that regard. And what, what appeals to, to me about it as well is how it connects to the larger Buddhist uh, sort of agenda, which is letting go. You know, when we look at the four noble truths that, that are about what causes suffering and what ends suffering, it's essentially that what causes suffering is clinging and what ends suffering is letting go. So, you know, we're we're all familiar with this idea in Buddhism of letting go. When we sit down to meditate, we try to let go of our thoughts and our our, obsessions and, you know, all the stuff that's going on in the the mind. And again, so we see that the Buddha, instead of telling us all the time what to do, a lot of what he's saying is telling us what not to do. And this, again, is kind of a, a real shift. Uh, and it, it makes sense because it, as he shows us in the Four Noble Truths, we realize that every time we're striving for something, it's starting from a point from the sense that I'm lacking something. So even with loving kindness, it can be like, oh, I'm lacking love. I need to cultivate more love. And that feeling itself, just that starting point, is dukkha, is suffering, you know, is unsatisfactoriness it's by definition. You know, I need this thing. I need this person. I need this job. I need this house. You know, whatever it is, you know, and by I need something means that I'm lacking something. So, you know, our impulse, our way of thinking, our our ordinary way of thinking is, oh, the way to be happy is to get the things that I want, and then I'll be okay. But in an actuality, the way that plays out is that we just stay in this cycle of wanting. So we're wanting things, we get some things, and then we want more things, you know. Uh, we want pleasure. We get some pleasure. We want some more pleasure. So we're, we're actually by pursuing and grasping onto things, we're conditioning ourselves to want more, habituating ourselves to want more. So the Buddhist principle is that if we let go and let go and let go, that we are conditioning ourselves to want less. And when we want nothing, 
we are by definition satisfied, right? That's satisfaction. Well, you know, again, our culture and our conditioning tells us that we have to get things to be satisfied. But the Buddha, very, his brilliance is that he saw that that did not work. That in fact, if we could learn to not want anything, that then we would finally be completely satisfied. And so in the same way, if we cannot hate anything, we are completely loving. You know, that's, that's, we have fulfilled the loving uh, principle. You know, when you're, if you're out there trying to love everything, <laughs> You have to find everything first. Where is everything? Is there anything hiding there that I'm not loving? Is there anybody out there I don't love? You know, but if it's just, oh, I'm just not going to hate anything, but you drop hate, what's there? Love. That, that joy and that fullness. So, um, I think that's, that's a good spot for me to, to wrap up. So I'll just say th- thank you for your attention. And I hope these words have been of some benefit and um, we have some time. So if people want to chime in with um, any questions or observations, be happy to hear them. Great. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, we really appreciate your talk and I'll just mention before we start uh, with the questions is that if anyone has questions in the room, I'm just going to repeat them because yeah, uh, last session we had like some issues with the microphone, so I'm not going to move it this time. Um, okay. With that, so you'll uh, repeat the questions in the room. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. Oh, there's one hand up. Uh, yeah, Tom, go for it. Kevin, this is Tom. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, you know, you arrived at a really profound place at the end of your talk that I wasn't expecting. And that idea that, you know, rather than trying to cultivate loving kindness, which is a form of grasping, it's more the opposite of just let, you know, falling away of whatever blocks it. Yeah. You know, I've, I've heard it said that the opposite of love is fear, yeah. you know, as opposed to hate, but you know, it's probably both. Um, can you talk, can you maybe speak a little bit about that? How our fears perhaps stand in the way of hmm. loving kindness? That's great. Thank you, Tom. That's, that, that's one of my chapters <laughs> <laughs> because just like you, you know, you're, maybe you're thinking, at least I was thinking of their, the, the book title, which is probably 40 years old. Love is letting go of fear. I don't know if you remember that one, but, um, yeah, I, th- I think it's really interesting to investigate how, uh, how anger arises and that, so fear comes out of a perceived threat and so our response to a perceived threat, you know, is, you know, fight or flight, basically. And so the, the, this makes a direct connection between fear and anger. You know, when, you know, I tell a little story about you know, a bad, uh, like a, a, a road rage incident. And, and I was the, well, I, I was cut off. This is like, you know, 40 years ago and on a freeway in LA and I was cut off and I, and I got enraged and went chasing after the person, you know, which, you know, is, we know very unwise, but in looking back on it, it's clear to me that the, the, th- the fear triggered this anger and and uh, i mean maybe it goes both ways but the, but it's what i think incumbent upon us is to then is when we are starting to feel anger i mean i think the point of this is is when when the anger is showing up is to bring some 
attention to that and reflection on the cause and see that it's because where we feel threatened that we're feeling this anger and that when we see that for ourselves in ourselves it's then i think possible to arouse compassion for ourselves cuz this is where we want to get to right when we're when we're dealing with these particularly these difficult feelings if we can have compassion for ourselves rather than either judgment or reactivity then it's a whole it shifts the whole emotional experience and the whole expression the mental experience of it too so when i see oh you know i'm i feel threatened and and a lot of the times what you know our fear is really ego fear right that that oh somebody somebody like okay like i get this email this morning right and and it's a threat right to my ego because someone is criticizing me. and it's like oh oh that's painful and this is goes back to something i was saying earlier to be able to see my own pain with compassion rather than with judgment you know rather than saying i shouldn't feel that or you know why i shouldn't be angry or uh, all, or or else blaming oh it's their fault that i'm feeling this and that, falling into that story i can turn back on myself and see oh that that vulnerable part of myself feels threatened and that's difficult and so to breathe with that and bring up an attitude of kindness and compassion toward myself but it really requires the thing that's hard about it is that these are pr- very primal emotions fear and anger and you know they're operating they're very rapidly right so in the in the brain process you know just reading about the brain stem and the you know the lizard brain and the mammalian brain it's like fear and anger come out of that lizard brain like that and that stuff comes up much faster than our prefrontal cortex can process it so it's very difficult to be mindful in those moments we have this is one of the reasons why we have to really train ourselves to be mindful much more habitually so that it's not like something we think of the next day like oh i should have shouldn't have acted like that that we can catch it so we're train and training ourselves to intervene in those reactive patterns and be able to stop and bring mindfulness in once there is mindfulness we have the capacity to transform the experience right we can see it oh all right i see where i'm coming from okay i'm okay like i don't have to fall into this now what what would be a wise way and then we can reflect carefully like what would be a wise way to respond here you know oh well i'm not going to write an email immediately back to this guy telling him he's a complete asshole and get off my you know you know lose my email i'm going to you know i i actually what happened this morning i mean to go off but i thought oh, i want i wonder what i said <laughs> so i i i started searching for the talk so i i want to listen to the talk uh, maybe i said something really stupid sometimes i do or or maybe oh maybe this person is really off base okay if they're really off base i'm just going to leave them alone cuz you, you know you don't respond but maybe there's something in there that i could learn from and and of course that then becomes much more valuable than being reactive right it's like oh there's fear and there's all these feelings but can i put them aside and is there something i can benefit from this situation so i hope that's helpful i know that's not capturing all of this issue um, it is but fair warning kevin uh you've now given 11 talks at gbf and we're about to publish all of those as a podcast so we'll go out to the world <laughs> oh no <laughs> so many ways i failed <laughs> you know there's a great saying from uh it's in suzuki roshi's book the zen mind beginner's mind he says a zen master's life is one continuous mistake <laughs> joshaku joshaku and so i i always take a lot of comfort in that <laughs> One, one continuous mistake i see a hand 
Did I see a hand? Yeah, there are a couple. Yeah, uh, Jeff has a question in the room. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Carmen, I really appreciate your uh, sort of unfolding that uh, notion about loving kindness and starting from a deficit. But you, and that really what we're trying to do is not generate something necessarily or add anything, but maybe or subtract anything, you know, but uh, the absence of neutrality, as you put it. Um, so I really like that. I appreciate that. It made it very clear. Thank you. Um, so did, did you get that? Of... Oh, yeah, you did get it. But he appreciates the 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 not adding something and not necessarily subtracting something, but sort of the absence of, uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think Steve had a question too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Kevin, for the talk. Uh, it really was um, enlightening for me in that I was taking all these notes. It's, it's sort of like reframing uh, from going from loving kindness to living kindness is really a very helpful reframing for me. Uh, this idea of non ill will, um, you know, like, like saying we don't have to embrace everyone. We don't have to love everyone, but we could have a neutral stance and not let, um, things out of our control, you know, rile us and make us angry or fearful. And so, um, I just really appreciate uh, your your perspective, and um, I really learned a lot. So I appreciate Wonderful. your talk. Thank you. So uh, I will. Uh, in, I think Shambhala will appreciate if I uh, put a link to the uh, page on the Shambhala website where you can purchase the book, and for a. About 12 more days until January 27th, you can get a 30% discount with using the code LK30. <laughs> so there you go. That's your advertising for the morning. <laughs> now, and I don't want you to be grasping after my book, though. You know, it's just it's such, uh, buying it with, uh, you know, I don't know how you, how you buy something without grasping. You know, good luck. Um. And, and Kevin, I had a question actually. Um, oh, I, I I just wanted to echo like that. I I love the talk today, and um, I and I, I really like the fact that you pointed to a part of the precepts that I never had paid attention before, which is the fact that they're not affirmative; they're negative, right? Like they're just like do no harm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Don't harm others with your sexuality and intoxicants and, and all of that. Um, and. And I confess that sometimes I, so I, I guess I struggle with two things. Sometimes I say too much, but sometimes I say too little or I do too much or I do too little. And I'm wondering why the emphasis um, of the precepts is on the negative side. Yeah, well, I, I will say there are also positive versions of all the precepts. So loving kindness is a positive <laughs> version of the precept to, to not kill. Generosity is a positive version of the precept to not uh, steal. Honesty is a, the positive version of not of not lying, and et cetera. So, so that's there. But I, th I think it just, you know, it's it's f first of all just a. A way, uh, uh, I mean, these guidelines, which we find in most religions, I think maybe all religions, are first just ways for human beings to live together. And, the, you know, if people do these acts of harm, it causes so much turmoil in society that you know, humans figured out a long time ago that they needed to have these rules that, because many of these precepts also are laws, <laughs> you know, so they're, they're really, uh, they start as a, as a, um, social contract. In the, in the spiritual realm though, what, 
Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's another of the great Buddhist scholars, says that following the precepts is about uh, spiritual purification or me- mental purification. That is, when we act in these ways, in these destructive ways, it creates mental reactions to it. If you are violent, you know, greedy, you know, harming people, stealing, your inner life is in turmoil as well. You know, you, the, it's, we know that there's a, there's a moral wound that happens when people kill. This is one of the reasons why so many soldiers suffer from PTSD. It's, you know, to put them in a, in a position where they're forced to kill and do, do violence. They come home and, and even though what they were doing was in the service of some, you know, you know, some purpose of the, of the nation and, and they're not, there's nothing criminal about it. They nonetheless have experienced this moral wound that, that then cr- creates this tremendous turmoil and suffering in their minds. So, I mean, that's just one example and it is a tragic example, but the, the, so the precepts from, uh, in terms of a spiritual framework are meant to help us to have inner peace, you know, to be so that when we sit down to meditate, we aren't besieged by guilt and shame and regret and all that goes along with that. Thank you. And and, and as I say, then once, once we have that baseline, then we start to act in positive ways. You know, and then generosity and, and, and kindness become, come forward. And, and those, but those, but the, the Buddhist, one of the kind of understanding, a principle of Buddhism is that when you let go of the negative aspects of the mind and of behavior, what arises naturally is this goodness, the Buddha nature, if you will you know, loving kindness and generosity, that these are natural human qualities that are kind of covered over by these more uh, negative instinctual uh, grasping elements. Yeah. Hi, my name is Grant. Um, thank you very much for your talk. There was so much in it. Um, I've been reading, uh, before I go to bed every night, just a one or two page um, have the children sort of mini teaching and she has one that I often do I read them two or three or four nights in a row so they really sink in and the one I've been reading recently I think is about loving kindness but also impermanent and also connection so this is a comment on a question uh, so far um, but it it says when you see someone else suffering, you know, re- reach out to them mentally and say, no. It says, when you yourself, see, I need to read it some more. <laughs> when you yourself um, feel suffering, remember that that is a human condition, that everybody feels suffering. And when you feel joy, remember that everybody at some point feels of joy, and um, that's a way of loving kindness, but I've been in myself a lot lately, and it's just such a good way to remember and interconnectedness and be interconnected. Um, and it really, my partner says, you know, the way to get out of depression is to do something for somebody else. Mm-hmm. And it just takes me out of my you know, judging and negative thinking. And so I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, uh, Yeah. I mean, one of the afflictions of, of humans is thinking that we are unique 
And so when we experience something difficult, we think that there's something uniquely wrong with us or uniquely painful for us. And, and to realize our shared humanity is definitely, uh, freeing. And, and the, la- the last comment about service, uh, and, and helping others as an antidote to depression. I remember reading that in Daniel Goleman's book, Emotional Intelligence. And it's, you know, in the 12 step world that I come out of, that's also a basic principle too, that, you know, we do, you do service to, to take your mind off yourself. So, yeah, thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we, so are there any announcements today? Uh, I have a copy of Kevin's book. Anybody wants to look at it? Okay, great. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I was going to bring some over to sell, but <laughs> one problem with uh, Zoom is you can't hand people anything through the screen. In the spirit of service, um, we do have we do need more volunteers to step up uh, in the Sangha to help with different things, and uh, we'll be talking in the board meeting today about volunteer positions, and one of them could be. Uh, Someone, if you're going to be on Zoom, you could become a Zoom host, um, keeping an eye on the room and things. Uh, something like set up here. So anyway, I just encourage people, as we all know, if you want to feel good, do some service for your sign and you feel more connected. But uh, talk to any other board or uh, if you want to step up and do more. I brought back uh, two bags of grapefruit. They're sitting out there on the table. Please help yourself. They're mm-hmm. from Hot Springs and they're freshly picked. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, I have a host today, so there's some fruit and cookies to enjoy. If you have tea, please just put your cup in the sink and I'll take care of it. Uh, I will also be coming around to Donna Bowl. Uh, Donna supports the Sangha, pays the rent, pays for it, honorary list of speakers. So. I think that you know, ten to twenty dollars would be great, but we'll take whatever you're willing to give us. And um, am I forgetting something? Yeah, we might meet at twelve thirty. I'll do like oh. there's a board meeting today, right? Yes. Sir. Yeah, yeah. So for for lunch after yeah, after so the meeting. We'll meet at the door for lunch. So if you're interested, yeah. uh, make that known to other people. Uh, Kevin, would you like to dedicate the merit, um, or we can also do our ourselves if whatever you prefer. Um, do you have a, do you have one that you usually yeah. do for the group? We, we can do that one. Uh, that'd be great. I mean, not that I don't want to, but I like to hear <laughs> what you guys do. All right. We'll do that right now. We're just going to gather in a circle. Right now. Um, but the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness, which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity, without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the quality of all that lives. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Juan. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.